I heard about this little girl. She asked her mom about how the human race got started. Her mother explained how God created Adam and Eve, and they had children, and they had children, and on and on it went. And here we are today. A few days later, she asked her father the same exact question. Dad, how did the human race get started? He explained how many, many years ago, there were monkeys, and little by little, uh, we became more, or they became more and more like people, and now here we are today. Confused, she went back to her mom, said, Mom, you said that God created the people, and Dad said that we came from the monkeys. So how can that be? Her mom said, Oh, honey, that's easy. I told you about my side of the family. Dad told you about his. <laughs> If you have your Bibles, hold them up in the air and let's say this all together this morning. Lord Jesus, I open my eyes to see, my ears to hear, and my heart to receive your word today. Amen. So my message today is entitled, Walking Above the Water. Walking Above the Water. Disclaimer, I do not encourage any of you, after this service gets out, to go home into your backyards and to try walking on your pool because that will not work out very well for you. But we are going to look at what the scripture says about how do we become water walkers in the sense of how do we rise above the circumstances? How do we walk above the circumstances that seem so scary that we're facing? You know, this is what Peter did in the Bible when, when they were on the storm. And we're going to talk about this right now. That's what Peter did. He walked on the water the same water that caused the rest of the disciples to freak out and be fearful for their lives. And so today we're going to look at how can we become water walkers. If you have your Bible, go to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. I want to encourage you guys, if you can come to that Jim Caviezel event, that'd be a great thing for you to show up to and support. Uh, we are very strong partners with Right to Life, Larry King's Right to Life. We believe that every single child in the fetus, all the way from conception to birth, is a child, and they deserve life. Um, they're doing great things in this community and, and awesome things, so I encourage you to go partner with them and to Go give to them and, and just help them out with what they're doing. And also that baby drive for the diapers. Man, Care Pregnancy is an awesome, awesome organization here in Visalia. Uh, and just a little fun fact, they gave us our very first ultrasound ever when we found out that we were pregnant with Matthew. And so we just love Care Pregnancy. They're, they've just been really awesome, and, and they do great things for people who are in need in this community. So please go uh, check them out and just partner with them and, and give them their support because they need it right now, especially in the political climate that we live in, in today's society. So Matthew chapter 14, verse 22, it says, Jesus immediately made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. So this was right after the feeding of the 5,000. The Bible talks about that there were about 5,000 men uh, in this pasture, and it's not including the women and the children. So this could be way over 15,000 to 20,000 people at a time that Jesus miraculously fed uh, food to. And, and he only had a couple fishes and a couple loaves of bread, and yet he fed over 10,000 people in one sitting. Now, that's a huge miracle. In fact, I heard a story one time of these college students who were at a Christian university and they believed the Lord for the same thing and, and they were people of faith. And they were in their room and they didn't have money to pay for food and do all these things. They were, they were broke college students. And so they were in their room or their dorm and there was a, a big group of them and they were all hungry. And so they all got their pizza that was sitting in the fridge that was leftovers and that wasn't enough for everybody. And they all laid their hands on that pizza box and said, Lord, if you can multiply fish and bread to feed 5,000 people, you can multiply this pizza to feed this room of people. And they all laid their hands on it, and they believed that, that that would happen. And when they opened the pizza box, the entire thing was full of pizza. That's a huge, awesome miracle. Amen? Amen. I mean, it's it, pizza. How better can it get? And so these type of things can happen to us today. These same things. I mean, many times I feel like we fall into the trap of reading the stories in the Bible and thinking, man, that was awesome. But, I mean, we've never seen anything like that again. I mean, when was the last time you've heard of 5,000 men, not including women and children, being fed with just a couple of fish and a couple of loaves of bread? 
We rarely hear that happening and the hearing those occurrences happen. But these same things can still happen to us today. Amen. These same things that God did, that Jesus did, can happen today. And they should be happening today. So if it continue in verse 23, it says, And he sent the multitudes away. He went up on the mountain to pray by himself. Now when the evening came, he was alone there, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now this is a huge story in Scripture because this, this was an example of the disciples having to trust in the word of Jesus. Um, one of the things that we, that we read here is that Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go to the other side. Now, we don't get the benefit of seeing the word for word of Jesus quoting, get into the boat and go to the other side, but we can all make out that that's exactly what happened, correct? That Jesus said, get into the boat, go to the other side, I'll meet you guys there later. And so he told them to get in the boat and go. And one of the things that's gonna happen in life uh, with us is that when we receive a word from God, Oftentimes, the devil doesn't want that word to come to fruition, so he's going to send a natural circumstance our way to try to uproot the word that was sown concerning what we're dealing with. The disciples got into the boat. Jesus said, you're going to go to the other side. Well, what happened? A storm came telling them, you're not going to go to the other side. So at this point in time, the disciples have a decision to make. I listened to what Jesus said about my circumstances, or I listened to what my circumstances are saying about my life. And that's a thing, that's something we all have to make out in our life. Are we gonna listen to circumstances, or are we gonna listen to what Jesus had said? So when life tries to throw you off course, we have to stay focused. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, it says this for by him, who's him? Who's he talking? We're talking about God. But more specifically, in John chapter 1, it says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So who is it talking about in John chapter 1? It's talking about God. But then it goes on to say, but then the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So when it's talking about these things, they're talking about all three of the same. God, the Word, and Jesus. They're, they're, they're all synonymous. And it says, for by Him or the, the words of God, by God, or by Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Whether they're thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things, someone say all things, all. were created through him and for him. Why is this verse re uh, relevant to what we're talking about? Because the very lake or the very sea that was causing the disciples trouble was the same sea that Jesus created. The same sea that the disciples were fearful about and the disciples were afraid that they were going to die in is the same sea that was spoken into existence by the words of Jesus. Now, here's where the danger of not understanding the scripture and, and understanding God's nature can come into play. Many will believe that Jesus caused the storm. It's not what happened. In fact, I was watching this video of these, uh, these people go throughout the Holy Land of Jerusalem, and they take tours, and they show people, this is where Jesus fed the 5,000, this is where he was raised from the dead, this is where he died, this is where he did this. And there's one video that I was watching about the Sea of Galilee, which is which what this sea was. And they started talking about how the conditions of the water were, and when a storm comes, this is what it looks like. And he started to point, he said, that's the mountain that Jesus went to go pray on when he sent the disciples. And while he was sharing the story, he then went on to say, you know, this is an awesome story because this, this was a storm sent by Jesus to test the disciples. And many people have that mentality that Jesus had sent them into their own dismay to teach them a lesson. But that's not what happened. But we can make out that this creation what that they're struggling against is the creation that God created in the beginning. Evil had now come in and is now trying to manipulate creation to go against everything that God has said. It did, did we not just read in Colossians that everything was made by him for him? 
It was all made for him. For God made everything with the intention of good. Everything with the intention of perfect. Yet when sin came, it ruined the original plan. So the storm came not because Jesus sent it, not because God caused it, but because this natural world that we live in has natural circumstances and the enemy was trying to stop the disciples from doing what Jesus told them to do. Notice how it said that Jesus made the disciples to get into the boat. Why do you think it says that? Well, most of the fishermen, or most of the disciples were fishermen. We have Peter, Andrew, James, and John, who were all fishermen by trade. If you were in our men's Bible study this last season, you would have known that. Uh, But they were all fishermen by trade, and that was their business. That was their livelihood, being out on the ocean, being out in the sea and fishing. And so I can suggest, or I can predict that the disciples might have seen the conditions of the water the conditions of the clouds and, and, for, and uh, saw a, a, a storm coming. And they might have been a little reluctant to get into the boat. Jesus says, get into the boat. And they look out and oh, I don't think I'm going to get in that boat, Jesus. And he made them get in there. He had to convince them, just get in the dang boat. <laughs> and I believe it's because they had this knowledge and they had this understanding of natural circumstances. You know, this is going to happen. If I get in the boat, it's not going to be good, Jesus. I don't want to do it. But he made them get into the boat. And let me tell you something. If the Lord has ever told you to do something that seems impossible, it's because he knows how to accomplish it. If he tells you to do something that doesn't make logical sense, it's because he's operating outside of logic to make it happen. You know, logic is just man-made sense. That's all that logic is. Logic is, is understanding things with our human brains. If it's illogical, it's because we can't comprehend it. We can't understand it. It's illogical. It doesn't make any sense. Jesus and God do not operate in logic, if you've ever seen that before in the scriptures. They oper- operate outside of logic. They operate outside of the natural. They operate supernaturally. So the, the disciples... Although they've seen the miracles of Jesus, although they just witnessed him feed over 10,000 people miraculously, although they've seen him raise someone from the dead and do all these great miracles, somehow, some way, they were still affected negatively by the storm. They were still impacted negatively by the conditions of the storm. Now, if you're writing notes today, I want you to write this first point down. Ponder what God has done in your life. I believe this is one of the biggest reasons why the disciples were so troubled in this story, because they did not ponder anything that Jesus had previously done. They witnessed it. They saw it. They were a part of it, but they didn't ponder. They didn't think about the things that Jesus had done. Look at Luke chapter 2, verse 19. This is when uh, the angel came to Mary to tell her all about the things that was going to happen concerning the virgin birth. And And it says, but Mary, that was a stunt. I did it on purpose. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. So when the angel told her, you're going to conceive a child, and, you're, and you're, it's, he's going to be named Jesus. He's going to be the Messiah. He's going to be called this and that and all these great things. You're going you're gonna to bear the Son of God. And she, the Bible says she wondered, how, how can this be since I've never known a man? And he, he began to tell her more things and more and more things. And then it says that she pondered all that was said. You know what that meant? She meditated on it. She, she, when she heard it, she put that into her heart, and she thought about it, and she meditated on it, and she, she was thinking about it continuously. That's what the word ponder means, to think about on a recurring basis. And Mary, she took that into her heart, and she thought about these things because she wanted to know how this was going to happen. In Mark chapter 6, verse 52, this is after the storm was over, it says, they considered not the miracle of the loaves, because their heart was hardened. The King James says they considered not the miracle of the loaves. The New King James says they they didn't understand about the loaves because their heart was hardened. 
This was right after Jesus calmed the storm, got onto the boat, and it says that they didn't ponder it. They didn't consider any of the miracles that he had done. They didn't think about how awesome he was and that, he, that they were literally with Jesus, the Messiah. They were literally with the living, walking God on the earth. Yet because they didn't ponder what Jesus had done previously, every other circumstance that came against them, they became fearful. One of the main reasons why Christians aren't living victoriously is because we are not pondering the things that God's done for us. Amen. We're, not, we're not making it a, a, we're not making a conscious decision to ponder about what God's done in our life. In Psalm 103, verse two, it says, bless the Lord on my soul, forget not all of his benefits. One of the, I, that's why I believe we're, so many Christians are so hurt and we're so broken and we're so defeated and we're so, we're so all of these negative things because we're not pondering anything that he's done for us. We're not reflecting on where he's taken us out. I mean, we, not, we might not be where, we're, where we think we would be, but thank God we're not where we used to be. Thank God we've at least advanced and we've at least gone further than where we've been before and that God's kept us from certain things and protected us and delivered us from things. We need to start pondering what he's done for us. Start reflecting on what he does for us. And I, that's why I want to encourage you, if you haven't submitted a glory story, now is a great time to do that. Amen. If you haven't taken time to sit down and just reflect, what has the Lord done in my life? What has the Lord provided for me? What has the Lord healed me from? What has he kept me from? What are all these things that, that could have taken me out but didn't because he's protecting me? Those things are meant for us to ponder, to reflect on. If you never reflect on God's goodness in your life, you will always be troubled whenever a hardship comes your way. And th this is even, even very applicable in marriage counseling. When, when you have two couples or when you have a couple and they were in love with each other for a few years and then after a few years that love dwindled down and after a few more years they just hate each other and despise each other the common denominator is that they stop pondering who they used to be they stop pondering the good things about their spouse they stop pondering how wonderful what they fell in love about with their spouse and over some time when you stop reflecting on those and stop pondering on those things, that love's gonna dwindle. That emotion that you feel isn't gonna be there anymore. Why? Because you're not reflecting on, what, on, what, on how good your spouse has been. You're not reflecting on the good things. You're only focusing on the negative current realities. And likewise with our relationship with God, if we're not reflecting and pondering on what God's taken us out of, what he's protected us from, we're going to, just like a marriage, we're going to fall apart and want to have nothing to do with him. In Mark chapter, uh, Mark, go to Mark chapter 6, verse 48. It says, Jesus saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was contrary against them. This is the same story, this different account. It says, now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea, and he would have passed them by. They were, they were straining. They were rowing. They were doing so much physical toiling in the circumstances that they were in. And we, we just read that they didn't consider the miracles of the loaves or they didn't think about what Jesus had just done. They weren't reflecting on anything that he'd done. And I think the only thing that makes our problems a big deal in our life is our unbelief. The, the, the main factor that makes our problems bigger than they actually are is our unbelief about the situation. Amen. Right. Amen. I've gone through a lot of things and I know people who've gone through certain things in life and I've gone through certain things in life and, and when you compare the two, one person is, is just cynical and one person is just so negative and they don't believe in, in certain things in the Bible, they don't believe in healing, they don't believe in God providing, they don't believe in any good blessing because they've been through this and, and they went through that and if God was this and how come I went through this and yet here I am and here are people that I know who've been through worse than me and worse than them and they've gotten past those things and they still believe, they still have faith, they still know what God's word says and they, they apply it to their life. The difference between the two of those things weren't the hardship happening, it's the heart in their hardship. It wasn't the, the things that came against them, 
Because everyone has things come against them. If you think that nothing, that you're the only person that bad things happen to, you're going to get off your high horse. You're not the only person that, that has life get thrown at you. You're not the only person who goes through hardship. You're not the only person who has to deal with this thing. The Bible says to consider all the brethren around the world who suffered the same sufferings as us. We have people all over the world suffering from, from harder things than we, than we suffer from. The difference between someone who is victorious and someone who is defeated is not that they had less or more suffering. It's that they had a grounded, a heart grounded in God's word. They had a heart that was established in the promises of God. They were, they were considering what God's done for them. But when we stop considering that and we look at the natural circumstances and start considering what if this happens, what if I'm not healed? What if I go through this? What if it doesn't get better? What if my child never comes back? What if my finances never get better? When we start considering the natural, that's when doubt and unbelief get fed. When doubt and unbelief get fed, it's like feeding a, 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 one of those, those plants that just keep growing and growing and growing, and you can never get it to, to die down because it's just overfed. It's just over, it's strong. We can't allow ourselves to feed the flesh more than we feed the spirit. That's right. Amen. Mm. We have to get back to ponder and reflect on all that God has done for us in the past. Yeah. Yeah. And when those things come against us, when those things come and try to afflict us and try to hurt us, when we are truly reflecting on what God has done, we can look back and say, you know what? God did this for me. This is a piece of cake. That's right. God's taken me out of this hardship. This is nothing. There's nothing too big for God. Amen? Nothing. How many believe that this morning? That there is nothing too big for God. If we truly believe that whatever we're facing is possible with the Lord, then there would be no room for fear to creep into our heart. If we truly believed that God could can, can deal with anything. You know, one of the songs, we, 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 we play songs for Matthew when, when he's just out in the, in, the, in the house walking around and playing with his toys. We'll have some Bible songs playing in the background just because he loves music. And one of the songs is from VeggieTales, and it's called, or not VeggieTales, one of the songs is from this Christian company that makes these, these, these songs. And the song talks about how our God is so big, our God is so big, so uh, strong, and so mighty. There's nothing our God cannot do. You know the song? <laughs> and it's such a great song. It's all it says over and over again. Our God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing our God cannot do. And it just says that over and over and over again to instill into our children, there's nothing too big for God. Ain't nothing too big for God. And we even sing that was a very similar song on stage here on Sundays. Talk about how, how big our, our God is, that our God is greater, stronger, better. Yeah. He's bigger than any mountain. He's, he's, he's huge. Yeah. And when we look at God and we magnify him in light of our circumstances, oh, man, that's nothing. Our circumstances are nothing compared to how great God is. But the moment we shift our perspective and we start magnifying the circumstances more than we magnify God, then those things become more powerful. Those things become bigger in our life. You know, what, when you get a magnifying glass and you put it over an, a subject, does the subject actually get bigger? No. What gets bigger? Your, Your perspective. See, God's as big as big can get. Nothing can make him bigger. But when you magnify him and you look at God through that lens of magnification and you magnify him in your life, in your perspective, everything else diminishes. But that only comes when we ponder, when we think about him, when we consider what he's done in our life. Whatever Jesus or whatever our problem is, when we are, whatever we are facing in life, have the assurance and the confidence that Jesus is walking on top of it. Just like on the water. The same water that caused the disciples all this trouble was the same water that Jesus was walking on top of. Whatever you're going through, know that Jesus is walking on top of it. And not only that he's walking on top of it, but he's called you to be raised up and elevated with him, to walk on top of it with him. Go to Isaiah chapter 26. 
Write this, this next point down. Works before his presence equals stress. Works before his presence equals stress. When we focus so much on what we can do over what he has done, we'll be stressed every time. Every time. When we focus on us getting the job done more than we focus on spending time with him and, and acknowledging him before, we'll be, we'll be overworked, we'll be stressed out, we'll be overwhelmed, it'll be difficult for us, we'll experience burnout, all because we put our own ability and our own works before acknowledging his presence first. My friend Dustin has a four-word of prayer, and it's really simple, anyone can say it, and it's very powerful, because when you say this prayer, you're acknowledging something. It goes like this, Lord, I acknowledge you. That's it. Lord, I acknowledge you. And when you say those four words and pray that four word of prayer, what you're doing is you are now saying, you know what? It doesn't matter what I'm facing. I acknowledge you first. I acknowledge that you are Lord over it. I acknowledge that every name that has a name must bow to the name of Jesus. So when you acknowledge him first, things become easier. When you acknowledge him first, things become less stressed. They become de-stressed. That anxiety becomes to, uh, starts to dissipate from your life. See, we don't have to be stressed out all the time. We don't. Amen. One of the lies that, that psychology has said and that the world and that the culture has said is, is the lie of stress management. How do you manage your stress? How do you handle your stress? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us to handle it. The Bible doesn't say to manage your stress. You know what the Bible says? To cast the care. To cast it. It's not yours to worry about. It's not yours to manage. If the Holy Spirit could talk in an audible form, I believe he'd be asking us the same question all, over, all the time. What are you doing handling what you're not supposed to be handling? What are you doing managing what you're not supposed to be managing? The Bible talks about how the Holy Spirit can be frustrated. Paul says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. I do not frustrate it. And I believe when, when it talks about being frustrated and frustrating the grace of God, I think it's when you ever had someone who's trying to do something that you're really good at, but they're not doing it very good. And you're just like, can I, can I help? Can I, can I need a hand? No, no, I'm good. I, I got it. I got it. And they drop this or they break that. Just like, Let me help you. <laughs> it's frustrating, isn't it? Yep. I think that's what the Holy Spirit has to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis with a lot of Christians. Let me just help you in this area. Oh, no, no, I, I got it, Lord. I don't need you for this. When the big thing comes, then I'll come call you. People are treating the Holy Spirit like an insurance company. They treat God like an insurance company. You know, God is always there for us, always, in the big and in the small. God is there in every detail of our life. But when we go to him like an insurance company and treat God like he's Jehovah Geico or something, and we only call him when we get in the accident, focus back in. That was my fault. I take responsibility. But when we only go to God when we get in this big accident, but we don't go to him for the day-to-day -day things, that's a, that's a very bad relationship, yeah. very bad relationship. But there is a way that we can remain in peace, we can remain not stressed, without anxiety, without depression, without all these things that come on us as a burden from life, and it's found in Isaiah chapter 26. It says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Ponder what he's done. Amen? Amen? When we put him before us, instead of putting our works before him, when we put Jesus before anything we do in life, this is the result. Perfect peace. Instead of being overcome by problems, we can overcome our problems by his promises. Amen? Let, can you put it back on the screen? Let's work this backwards. It says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. So the root of all of this is how much do you trust God? That's the root. 
How much do you trust him? Because if you trust him, what's naturally going to happen? Your mind's going to be on him. Your mind's going to be fixated and focused on him. And if your mind is stayed on him, what will you then experience? Perfect peace. So the beginning of it is trust. You have to trust God. You have to trust him with everything that you have. It says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, what? Lord, I acknowledge you. Acknowledge him in all your ways. Not some. Not when you have this big, big decision to make. Not only then. But even when you go to the grocery store, I, I, I take this literal. If God wants us to acknowledge him in every, every single way of our life, then why stop when it comes to the small things? Why stop when it's deciding what street to take when we go to our destination? Why do we stop when we, when we try to go to the store and buy certain things that we don't think to ask God, what should I buy today? You don't think he'll lead you to the best price? You don't think he'll lead you to not buy expired milk? And someone said, amen. That's the worst thing to do. Oh, man. God will lead you to the best every time we acknowledge him. But it all starts with trusting in him. We have to trust him. And look at what 1 John chapter 5 says in the New Living Translation. It says, for every child of God, say, that's me. Someone say it again. That's me. For every child of God defeats this evil world, and we achieve this victory through our faith. So we are overcomers. Amen? Amen. We are able to overcome the obstacles of life and not be overcome by them because of this victory. And what was the victory we have? The victory is through our faith. Look at Romans chapter 10, uh, verse 17 says, it says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if this victory, which is our faith, overcomes the world and we need that faith, how do we get that faith? The Through the word of God. Through the word of God, by putting this before everything else, by putting this in front of our eyes before we turn to any other resource. The word of God, it develops our faith. It's, it, the word of God is like going to the gym. The more you feed into the word of God is like the more you go to the gym and build your muscles. The more you go, the consistent you are with it, the bigger you're going to become, the stronger you're going to feel. And the more you're consistent with the word of God, the bolder you're going to become, the stronger you're going to feel when it comes to faith. Amen? Amen? This needs to be the first priority in our life, the word of God, especially if, if it deals with faith overcoming the world, we need more of what the Bible can give us if we want to become world overcomers. Write this one down, number three. If your life isn't supernatural, it's superficial. If your life isn't supernatural, it's superficial. In John chapter 6, verse 21, this is the same story we've been talking about with the water and the storm and the disciples. It says, then they willingly received Jesus into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. Just think about that for a second. The boat was in the middle of the sea, the Bible says, tossed by the wind and the waves. Then Jesus goes and meets them by walking on the water. He calls Peter out into the water, which we're going to talk about next week. He calls Peter out on the water. Then they go back to the boat together, walking on the water. And he calms the sea, calms the storm, and immediately, someone say immediately. Immediately. Immediately, the boat was at the land. They teleported. They went from one place immediately to the other place. And we're, we're in a boat here. We don't, we don't have zero to 60 in four seconds, all right? They, they were in one place at one instant and then another place at another instance. Supernatural. I, I have a couple of friends that have a, a very similar story to this. 
um, in their life where they were driving and, and they were, um, one of my good friends, he's, he's, he's a lot older than I am and I, I respect him so much and he has so many stories to tell, but he told me a story one time of being here in Visalia and having to go down to LA for a meeting and he was driving there and he was going to be late, 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 late. And he was driving there and, and he just said, Lord, if I can somehow get there on time, I don't know how, but if I can somehow get there on time, I would appreciate it. <clears throat> and he, he took off down the 99 all the way down south, then got up the grapevine, went down and got to LA. He got there hours before he was supposed to get there. Hours before he was supposed to get there. He don't know how it happened. All he knows is that at one moment, but when he was leaving, he looked at the time and he knew he was going to be late. And when he gets there, he is early. How can anyone, he didn't speed. He, he obeyed the traffic laws. He didn't speed. He didn't take any shortcuts. He took the normal route and he got there within hours before he was supposed to be there. That's some supernatural uh, movement right there. Uh, he, the same guy told me another story where he was driving late at night and and, and it was getting dark and he was getting sleepy and he saw, uh, right before he, he closed his eyes, he saw this telephone pole that he was about to run into and he closed his eyes and just said, Jesus, and all of a sudden his car just stopped and he looked in the rearview mirror and there was a telephone pole right behind his car. Immediately behind it, or right in, in behind his car. Completely avoided it. I have another friend who was sharing another story where they were, they were going up this hill <clears throat> out in the country and they were going up this hill and as they approached the, the crest of the hill, they came downhill, and that car had no brakes to it, man. It was, it was older than old, and there was a few people in there, and they were trying to slow down, but they couldn't. They were, just, they were just coasting down the hill, and there was a bunch of cattle trying to cross through the road, and they couldn't stop on the brakes. And so as they were driving, they just said, Lord Jesus, get us out of this. And they closed their eyes, and when they opened their eyes, they looked in the rearview mirror, and there's all the cows right behind them. Not a single one was hit. God can do impossible things. Amen? And that's, that's a supernatural life. And to most people, that's not normal. It's not normal for us to experience those type of things. And people try to justify why these type of stuff is happening and why all these things were happening. But... The Bible clearly talks about crazy stuff happening to the disciples, to Jesus. And not only was his boat affected by this, the Bible says that there were multiple boats all around them. It was the disciples' boat and then multiple boats all around them in the sea. So it didn't just affect the disciples. It affected everyone else who saw all that happen. And so what we have to understand is that our life is called to a supernatural life. That's where God lives. God lives in the supernatural. That's where, he, that's where he, he, he lives. That's where he created everything from. That's where he abides. That's where Jesus is at. And when we become Christians, we are given access to live in that supernatural realm. Amen? Amen. If we've never been in a situation that requires the supernatural to take place, it's because we're living life too, too shallow. We're living life too careful. We, we, we don't take any risks to operate in the supernatural. God wants us to be living in supernatural more than we want to live in the supernatural. And write this point uh, down, number four. Nothing is too big for him. Nothing is too big for God. Going back to Mark chapter 6. It says, then he saw them, he, he watched them struggling and rowing and toiling against the wind because it was all contrary against them. Then he came to them walking on the sea and he would have passed them by. The reason why it says he would have passed them by is because they were so occupied trying to get out of the storm, they would have missed him. Wow. He was there offering help and they were so busy with what they were doing, he would just walk by and pass them until one of them saw that. He, they thought it was a ghost and said, oh, is it a ghost? And they were all afraid. But then he says this in verse 50, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. You know how easy it is to be of good cheer when the storm's passed? How about when you're in the storm? How can you be of good cheer in the storm? It's very hard to do. 
But the way we do it is all by your focus. What are you, what are you focusing on? What are you pondering on? Are you thinking about the storm or are you thinking about Jesus? Are you thinking about the difficulties or are you thinking about the precious promises he's given us? This is why Paul said many times, rejoice. Count all these afflictions, count all these sufferings of pure joy, he said. He says, that's why I can rejoice in tribulation. That's why I can rejoice in this hardship. See, Paul, man, he was able to rejoice before he saw the other side. He was able to be of good cheer before any good thing happened during his persecution, during his affliction. I believe it's because God, or Paul, had such a good understanding that anything is possible with God. Amen. That nothing was too big for God. See, God is never surprised by the things that are overwhelming us. God doesn't look at our circumstance and go, oh, I don't know if we have enough energy or power. Let's tap into the reserves for this one. God is not surprised by anything that we face. It says Jesus was watching them, struggling and rowing. He watched them. He saw it. He wasn't surprised by it. When things happen in our life, we have to know, we have to have an understanding that God can do anything. That God is so powerful, any situation can be turned around. Any situation. Yeah. That we serve a God who is so big that not only can he do these things, but he has done these things through Jesus. Mm -hmm. That when Jesus died on the cross and gave us the authority and gave us the power, it's a done deal. Yeah. We have to know that that's the kind of God we serve. Yeah. We serve, serve an impossible solving God. Yeah. Do you believe that this morning? Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Jesus was out on the water to go help his disciples, but there was no help until there was a demand on that help. Have you ever noticed that before? He was out there on the water. He wasn't waving his hands. Hey, guys, it's me. It's Jesus. You see that happening in the scripture? He walks down to the water, would have walked them right, right by, would have passed them by. It wasn't until the disciples noticed Jesus, thought he was a ghost, and cried out. See, Jesus is always offering to help us, but we have to make a demand on his power. We have to acknowledge that he's there and demand on the power. Now, when I say demand, it's like when you go to the bank. When you go to the bank, you make a demand on whatever it is you want. If you say, I want this, I want, I want to withdraw this money in my life, you're demanding what you want. You're demanding what's already yours. It's, it's already your possession. It's just not in your possession, right? Yep. And when you say, I want this withdrawn, what does the bank have to do? <laughs> Give you the money. Why? Because it's yours. Jesus gave you power and authority. He said, what I have, I give it to you. This is mine. You go, you go make disciples. You go heal the sick. You go cleanse the lepers. You go cast out demons. You go raise the dead. You do these things. It's ours, right? It's ours that he gave to us. And when we make a demand on that, it's ours. We're, we're rightfully saying, Lord, I want to use this power you gave to me. He will always be there to help us. But we have to acknowledge that he's there in the first place. We have to understand that he is there wanting to help us in every single time, nothing is going to be too big for him. Nothing will be too big for him. I don't care if you've if you got a, a report that you're going to die. Nothing is too big for him. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. I'll leave you with one more thing. In, in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 16, Paul had this great opportunity to show us how to show, how to be of good cheer in the midst of, of bad situations. Yeah. All these things that we're talking about today, Paul applied to his life. And when he was in his missionary journeys, uh, he went to this place, he was traveling to Macedonia, and he didn't really get that far. And he encountered this woman who was a, uh, she was a fortune teller. She'd predict the future and kind of just say, say certain things about the future. And, um, 
And she was, she was pretty accurate because she was operating under a demonic power. She was operating under a demonic power. She was possessed by, the, by, by devils, and um, she was owned by these masters who would make money off of her from her soothsaying, from her fortune-telling. And so Paul, he rebukes this demon and gets it cast out, and this woman got delivered and freed from it, and her masters noticed that there's no more profit with her, that she can't make them a dime anymore, that she's useless. And so they get frustrated with Paul and Silas, and they take them before the leaders of that day and the, 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 the rulers, and they start claiming false accusations against them, saying that they're teaching ungodly things, that, that they're Jews when Paul wasn't. So they're Jews, and they're pulling the race card on them, and they're doing all these horrible things to them. And Paul and Silas get thrown into prison. And it says that at midnight, they were thrown into the deepest part of the prison. There was no light. There was, there was nothing for them to see. Their, their, their hands and their neck and their feet were put in the stocks. So they were, they were stretched out very uncomfortably. And the Bible says at midnight, Paul and Silas worshiped God. They praised the Lord. And the other prisoners heard it. And as they were praising God, a supernatural earthquake happened. And it broke all the chains. It broke open all the doors. All the, everything that caused those prisoners to be bound were loosed. And they were able to walk as free men. Now, how was Paul able to praise God in the darkest moment, in the darkest night of his life? Because he, he knew who God was. He knew there was nothing too big for him. That God could do, he, he could work any situation for his good, any situation. And the good that came from it, he became a free man. All the other prisoners were listening to Paul and Silas praying, and none of them left when they got freed. None of them. They all remained there. I believe Paul and Silas' worship impacted them so much that they had a chance to become saved as well. And then after that, the prison, the, the, the prison guard, he thought that they were all gone, so he was going to kill himself. And Paul said, don't, don't do that because we're all here. And he led him to the Lord as well. See, there's nothing too hard for God. Amen. Nothing. And the moment we start going, oh, yeah, but that was, that was then. I mean, when was, when was the last time you saw that happen? When was the last time you saw a supernatural earthquake? Well, I believe the earthquake happened because Paul and Silas were just praising God so good that God had started to stomp his feet to the beat, and the earthquake happened. If an earthquake don't happen when you're praising, it probably ain't that good. But we can, we can remain in peace. We can remain in joy throughout anything that happens. We can remain above the waters and not let them overcome us. We can overcome them and remain in joy. Amen? Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. Thank you, Jesus.